without a question, there's a lot of people who are like interested in what you do, or would love to do what you do, love to be photographers. So can you tell us a little bit about how you developed an interest in photography? Um, well, I, I took classes in high school, and that was uh, a pretty interesting thing. My high school teacher was a guy named Ori Schaefer, and when I flew into the Indianapolis airport on this trip, uh, he actually had to show his artwork up in the airport, so it felt like uh, it felt like coming home, you right. know, in a really nice way. Uh, I'm from West Lafayette, Indiana, originally, so this is my home state and uh, that kind of thing. But I took it in high school, and then when uh, I started college, I started as a literature major, mm. and then I took a photo class, and I realized that yeah, this is uh, this is the thing. So I just kept taking more classes, and uh, eventually changed majors, and now it's what I do. Uh, what? Did what move, what like what drew you to photography? So you had your literature classes, but like what set that what set photography apart yeah. from your literature classes? Uh, I mean, I'm always interested in narrative, and all of my work is narrative in nature. So I'm interested in stories and how stories are told, and who tells stories, and whose stories are told, and whose stories are untold. Uh, photography is just one one way of doing that. Uh, there's a, a really famous curator that once referred to photography as a sophisticated way of pointing, which uh, I really like. You know, you're calling attention to something, you're singling something out. Uh, like, you know, with all the activity that goes on in the world, you know, it's a way to hone in, you know, on a very particular thing. And uh, I really like the medium a lot, you know, in that regard, that you can call somebody's attention to something, that you can make them aware, you know, of a social issue or make them aware, you know, of a person and linger, you know, with that person and really, you know, get to, you know, get to feel something about them. Uh, so for me, it's about the way photography describes and, you know, the stories that it can tell. That's, that's interesting. So it's kind of like literature, but in a like, mm -hmm. different medium and in a different way. You're yeah. still telling stories, but in a... Yeah, and uh, I can't seem to get away from literature either. Like, mm -hmm. it, it still influences the way that I think, and a lot of my work has a text component to it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you never escape uh, your first love. Uh, in college, when I changed my major to photography, I also picked up a major in design, and the reason for that was because I could, you know, find a way to incorporate uh, text with my images. And uh, I realized I could take five more classes and have gotten a, a, a literature major <laughs> too, but they wouldn't recognize uh, three majors, so wow. I didn't stick around for that, that mm. extra. I but uh, I, for me, they're all intertwined. Yeah. Uh, so shifting points now, like what? So I know, like, I personally, like, really enjoy film and I really mm -hmm. enjoy doing photography, but something that is sometimes a struggle is when you have, like, a creative field like this one, how mm -hmm. do you take that into, like, because a lot of people see it as a hobby, how do you mm -hmm. turn that into your career? Yeah, I mean, there's no easy answer to that, and everybody figures out, you know, their own path uh, with it. Like, everybody's got to make a living, right? Mm -hmm. But um, if your, your way of making a living can sort of dovetail into the kinds of projects that you want to work on, you know, I think that's a really, uh, really helpful thing. Um, so I don't know that there's a single path or anything like that that I can prescribe. But uh, at the same time, I think if you really like what you do, that helps. And if you do it a lot, that helps. And if you do it a lot, eventually people will pay attention. And then you keep doing it even more. And uh, eventually you'll get some recognition for it. Yeah. And then you do it more still and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, I sometimes think that, think that being an artist isn't really a, a choice. It's what people are compelled to do. Right? Like you, you do it because you don't know how to not do it, you know? So for me, it's a way to understand the world around me. And uh, as I try to figure things out, like that comes out in my projects. Uh, like it, it's an analytical tool, you know, to understand something about myself or something about the world. That's, that's actually like really interesting. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to being like a, a working artist, mm -hmm. you also hold full-time um, faculty appointment in mm -hmm. the photography department at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. How does teaching fit into your broader calling of like the storyteller and the photographer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful synergy, right? Because you get to share what you're excited about, you know, with students that are also excited about the same thing. Uh, Mike is a private art school. We have about 2,500 undergraduates, I think, and about 300 graduate students, so we're slightly smaller than, than Valpo. But all of those students study visual art, so like we don't even have performing arts. It's all visual art. And it's exciting to be around that energy. Like my students continually surprise and amaze, or you know, they'll turn up something you know, that, uh, that makes me question you know, some of the things that I'm doing and makes, makes me, uh, uh, I, I guess, really analyze you know, why I do the things that I do in order to help them do the things that they do. Uh, and with that, I think there's a beautiful synergy between like sharing and 
taking energy, you know, and I think it goes both ways. I get energy from them and I give energy to them and uh, vice versa. That's cool. Um, so your projects, your personal projects, mm -hmm. cover a lot of uh, a lot of subjects from Confederate statues to like your Twitter <laughs> project. Um, what is the connective thread or the idea that links mm -hmm. um, like the um, that links like those two types of projects? Like, yeah. For you, like. So I, I think of my current body of work as, as three parts. Okay. Uh, so the first part is the work that I do with Marty Schindelman, and it has to do with location and technology, like how technology identifies and specifies location. Uh, the project that we're most well known for is the Twitter work uh, called Geolocation, where we look at where tweets come from and make mm -hmm. pictures on those sites. Uh, the second body of work is the work that I do in Baltimore, and it's very much about making a portrait of the community at this moment in time in a really difficult moment in the city that I live in. Uh, so it's about connecting people like to the place you know of the city, and then the third project is a long-term project looking at all the cities that have been the the population center of the U.S. over time. There are 25 of them spread out across eight states, uh, you know, running the uh, the range of U.S. history, and it started near where I live in Maryland, uh, and it's currently in Missouri, but it goes through Ohio and Indiana, which are states that I've lived in, as well as Illinois, which is the state that I've lived in, and then my brother lives in Missouri with his kids, so. You know, it hits uh, it hits my family history in addition to uh, you know to being of interest, uh, and with that work, I'm trying to make portraits of these cities. You know, like who lives there, what are the issues that are important, you know, both to the city and to the people. So all of my uh, my work has a connection between place and technology and data and people, and there's a sort of pendulum that happens between looking at something from an analytical distance, you know, and then like really getting to know somebody one on one and having that sort of uh, very personal experience. Uh, both with the place and with the uh, with the person, so I see all those threads connecting all of those projects. How did you come to find like how did you kind of synthesize all of this information? Going from like I see like we have geolocation, so we have mm -hmm. location, and then where like and the tweet, and then how did that come together? Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, things, uh, John Cage, the uh, composer, is, is quoted as saying that work leads to work, and mm -hmm. uh, I always find that I don't necessarily know where I'm going, but things come up in the process of researching a project. So with the Twitter stuff, uh, Marnie and I were doing a project where we were doing, um, we are taking text messages and we were translating them into semaphore flag, and the whole idea was to take instant communication and make it slow and awkward. Um, so it's kind of this funny thing, but in the process of doing research for that, uh, we found this uh, really uh, pretty pretty crude, pretty early uh, mashup developer tool that put tweets on a map, and we went, oh, that's interesting. You know, let's look at that. So the first one we shot, we went to the location, and uh, it was a tweet uh, right during the, um, right in the middle of the financial crisis when nobody knew whether the banks were going to get bailed out and, you know, what was going to happen if the economy was exploding. And it was a tweet about somebody losing their job, and it was coming out of City Hall in downtown Chicago, which is right next to the uh, financial district. So it felt really resonant, like with the time, you know, like it was a timestamp of that moment. Uh, and we stood on that street corner for like three hours. We shot some video. We did some time lapse photography. We did some stills. We interviewed people. You know, like what do you think about this tweet? Like that kind of stuff. And then uh, eventually it got pared down to uh, to a single image. And it felt really um, like the tweet is an isolated little blip. And it felt like the photograph, like the single image, sort of mirrored that, uh, you know, that that kind of experience. Uh, and then from there, you know, like we showed a set of photographs to a curator, uh, and there were photographs, I was living in Chicago at the time, and Marty was in Rochester, New York, so it was primarily in those two cities. Um, but we showed a, a portfolio to a curator at a conference, and she uh, had an art center in England that she worked with, and she said, you know, hey, what would it look like if you came to England and made a set, like, of this community, like, for this uh, gallery? And we hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but it was an amazing opportunity because it made us realize that we could do this as a a site-specific thing, like we could make a portrait of that community through their social media activity for them to see in the gallery situation, and maybe it could be a way to um, let people know what their neighbors are thinking about or feeling. Like, it, technology can be alienating, like, mm -hmm. we think of it as connective, but it can also be distancing, right? Like, people disengage or, you know, don't talk as much anymore, so we thought maybe the art could be a way to uh, stimulate those conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, nine years later, we're still getting invited to go places and, uh, and make pictures you know, for that. So most recently we were in Qatar in the Middle East uh, working on a set there for, a, for a, um, a conference and for hopefully a gallery show. So we'll see, uh, we'll see where that all, all leads. Uh, and we're still talking to a couple of other organizations about doing new sets. So 
it's become something that uh, it continues to be exciting because we get to go to new places and sort of explore new new kinds of digital traffic and mm -hmm. think about identity and how identity plays out in those kinds of spaces. That makes sense. Have you, you know, you use social media mm -hmm. and you, you said that this is a pretty ongoing project, mm -hmm. 10 years. Have you noticed a shift in the way that people are responding to this project as people have a have like an evolving relationship with their social media and those. Yeah, I mean, I think of uh, social media as a negotiation, right? Like everybody's trying to figure out how much to share or not share. And for a while, it was really hot to check into things, you know, online. Uh, I don't know if it, it is still as hot. I find that I'm getting older, so I'm a little disconnected from what, um, you know, with the, the younger generation, you know, feels about that. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about, um, uh, like my cousin passed away a few years ago and his Facebook page is still very active so I've been thinking a lot about digital ghosts and what it means like if our social media outlives us like people still post on his page um, you know in memorial mm -hmm. you know or thinking about him or you know those kinds of things so Marnie and I are talking about that and maybe that'll you know that'll lead to something um, but I read somewhere that uh, by 2025 I believe uh, there will be more dead people on Facebook than live people uh, which is a really interesting you know sort of uh, sort of thought so I don't mean to suggest that, you know, like the work will become all about death or anything like that, but I think social media is this evolving thing, right? Like when we started the project, it was still pretty new. I think Twitter was two years old when we started uh, the project, you know, but now we have the president in the United States that's using it as a platform and uh, I would argue as a weapon to punish his political enemies. And, uh, you know, that's a really interesting thing, you know, to think about like how it gets used in that way, you know, but then also all the other social functions, like it gets used as journalism, it gets used to keep in touch with friends and family you know, gets used as memorial pages, uh, like I was talking about a moment ago. And I, I think that social media is also at a crossroads in terms of what they want to be. So, like, Facebook played a role in this last presidential election, and they're not even fully acknowledging how big of a role that was. But suddenly there were all these ads paid for by Russian money, you know, and outside groups to influence this election. And, you know, they're trying to figure out, like, are they a platform, are they a news agency, like, do they have responsibility for the content that gets posted? You know, do they have responsibility to police hate uh, groups, you know, online? And looking at how this uh, rally in Charlottesville started, that like that was all an online organized, you know, kind of thing. So I, I think that we as a culture have a lot of things to figure out with that too. You know, like what, what all of our relationship collectively, you know, is to that in addition to what all of our individual relationships are to that. Noticing, I see you have a very really keen, I, mm -hmm. like, um, attention to like detail when it comes to social media and how it informs the public and how the public uses it. Have you as an artist changed the way you've done this project specifically in like has that shifted as people are starting to use social media in different ways? Well the uh, the work has gotten a lot more political lately. Uh, in the early days um, it wasn't you know a political thing for us like it was thinking about privacy and thinking about boundaries and what people share voluntarily uh, but we went to Russia last year and made a set of tweet photographs there that was based on the hashtag thanks to Putin for this. Uh, and then in the U.S. we made photographs with the thanks Obama hashtag uh, in the sister cities. Uh, in Russia we were in St. Petersburg and Moscow and we photographed in the sister cities of uh, Los Angeles and Chicago uh, here. But, you know, that will hopefully be our second book and, you know, is trying to look at how uh, these platforms get used for these political purposes. And, you know, I think it reflects our, our sort of bigger interest in how like of this moment, I think Twitter is a very political vehicle, you know, and our president, uh, you know, used it to to achieve that office. Like he started out uh, as a, I, I don't know, I don't want to attack him on a personal level, but uh, you know, he was a celebrity, uh, but he used social media to become a political presence, and a lot of that started with the Obama birtherism things, where he chased Obama on Twitter, you know, badgering about the birth certificate, which uh, you know I believe is a. Uh, comes out of racist belief systems um, and he was able to parlay that into the Republican presidential nomination and then eventually you know into the presidency so I, I think that you know this is the the first president presidency that's really born of social media like Obama used it to organize but like this you know this one took on some darker undertones and a lot of that was made possible by social media and by these platforms so I think the work has become more entwined in that as as the culture changes has that, how has like that been able to, because I know that you mentioned you being able to use art as a way to understand the world. Mm -hmm. How is doing this project and, and viewing it mm -hmm. through this lens kind of 
and like informed you as like your own self. Yeah. Well, lately I've been feeling a little sad about social media. <laughs> Uh, I know that's not the most productive or hopeful response, but I'm feeling a little bit of uh, of despair, uh, both with this presidency and with the darker tones that I see on social media right now. Uh, things like this uh, this Take a Knee campaign, you know, where uh, African American athletes are speaking out against what they see as uh, uh, systemic racial injustices in the U.S. Uh, and I think it's amazing to see how Colin Kaepernick uh, chose a very deliberate gesture of kneeling, which is normally thought of as a gesture of respect, like you would kneel before a king. Uh, you know, it's a, a way to pay tribute, um, but he, you know, he used it as a protest to take a knee, and suddenly, you know, social media has become weaponized again, and people are talking about it online, and I'm seeing some very dark, dark, dark uh, stuff, you know, happening around that, where I, I, I don't know, like, I, I think that social media reveals the, the racial, um, I think America has a deeply problematic history of race, and I think that it's, it, social media has laid that bare and uh, has really made me see how much work we still have to do, you know, as a nation and as a culture uh, to get to a better place. Uh, I think that I was feeling more hopeful um, before this president, and now I'm trying to figure out how to contribute productively to that conversation to help educate and to, um, you know, hopefully figure out how to get us culturally to a better place. How to do that, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the, uh, the million-dollar question. Um, but I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, if I keep doing the work and if I keep the conversation going, I'm hopeful that eventually enough dialogue can help, you know, just move the needle a little bit. Like, I know I'm only one person, but mm -hmm. if I can move it a little bit, then I think, uh, you know, it will have been worth it. So your another um, project that you're working on is very timely and very mm -hmm. relevant to this conversation. Um, so you started A House Divided mm -hmm. um, in 2010 and 2011. Uh, what, so that's, um, what kind of drew you to the uh, threads of Confederate history and, and how So that. I grew up in Indiana, and uh, I never thought about the Civil War. Like, it just mm -hmm. wasn't present for me here. Um, like, I th we thought a lot about frontier history. Where I grew up, they do the uh, Feast of the Hunter's Moon, which celebrates frontier history. But, you know, like, the, the Civil War just wasn't something I thought about. Uh, and then I moved to Baltimore to teach at, at MICA. Like, I moved there for that job. I'd never been there before the job interview. I didn't know anything about the city. Uh, other than, you know, I liked the job and I wanted to, I wanted to pursue it. Uh, and when I moved there, I started digging, you know, a little bit deeper. And Maryland uh, tried to secede during the Civil War. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. But because it was north of D.C., Lincoln held the legislature at gunpoint to keep them from signing uh, the secession papers, even though they had voted to, you know, to secede. Uh, an early assassination attempt on Lincoln also happened there. Uh, and then John Wilkes Booth is from Baltimore. He's from Bel Air, which is a, a suburb of Baltimore. Uh, and he's also buried in Baltimore, about a mile from uh, from where I teach. Uh, so it was suddenly very present for me, you know, in a lot of ways. And I started to see a lot of Confederate activity when I moved there in a way that really took me off guard. Like um, in Indiana, there's a lot of uh, a lot of rural culture and some of that, you know, gets linked to the Confederate flag. But it never felt so primary for me until I moved there. And then it, it, it was really an attempt to, uh, to unpack that. Um, Baltimore also has had, well, still has, because we haven't fully gotten rid of them, uh, but we have uh, four Confederate sculptures, uh, monuments. And it's really interesting to, to look at those. Uh, they were removed recently after uh, Charlottesville from their pedestals, but they're still in the city uh, under tarps in a, a city impound lot, which is really interesting that you know, they have impounded cars and then these, you know, sculptures <laughs> under blue tarps uh, that are there. But uh, the one that got the most controversy was this one of Lee and Jackson, uh, and it was a double equestrian sculpture with the two of them on horseback. And it, it's interesting to see when uh, that was built. So um, to give a little bit of context, Baltimore has a, a long history of what are called racially restrictive housing covenants, meaning that they're legally uh, there were legal restrictions on where black folks could live in Baltimore City. Uh, the Supreme Court overturned that in 1948, and that same year is when that sculpture went up, uh, 1948. So when we talk about those sculptures, like, they're not historical, like, they're not of, you know, of that moment. Uh, Lee and Jackson never came through Baltimore, and, you know, if they ever visited, it wasn't during the war and it wasn't together uh, kind of thing. So there was no historic reason for that sculpture to be there. Like, it wasn't marking a battle. It wasn't marking a historic event. Uh, but if you look at, uh, at when that sculpture went up in 1948, it was paid for by a, a financial guy, like he was in the financial industry. He paid for it with private money, and he put it up in a white neighborhood. Uh, and it was a white neighborhood on the edge of a black neighborhood, and I'm sure that it was, uh, 
a not welcome sign, like a very large not welcome sign, and it went up right when those uh, racially restrictive covenants were struck down by the Supreme Court. So, like, I don't think that that's coincidence, you know, like, I, I, th I think that, uh, like, if it is historical, it's historical to that moment in time in 1948, you know, post-World War II, and to some of the racial struggles that were happening both in the city of Baltimore, you know, and in cities around, you know, around the country. So, if anything, I think it's historical of uh, the early days of the civil rights struggle, rather than historical of the Civil War. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, I know that Confederate statues, at least now, or um, in the recent past, have been a topic uh, across the news. What has your work in making photos of these spaces taught you about the like act of commemoration, or um, if there is a right way to remember the Dark Ages, yeah, and the, like dark parts of our history? And I don't know if there's a right way or not. Uh, personally, I don't think that the sculptures are appropriate for public places. Uh, Baltimore, as a city, is 64% black, uh, and what, is it, what does it say to see, you know, two men that fought a war to oppress black people, you know, honored in a public space, you know, in that way, especially knowing that it was paid for with private money uh, and yeah. put up, you know, at that moment in Baltimore uh, as a city. So I think it was an appropriate decision to, uh, to take it down. Uh, so originally, um, when the conversation started in the aftermath of the Baltimore uprising, uh, the mayor put together a commission of experts that were supposed to study this issue uh, and make a recommendation on what to do with these sculptures. And with that, they held public forums. Uh, and I went to the public forums because I was curious. And basically, people could spec step up to the mic and you know could say their piece. And it was interesting for me, like how people talked about these. So the the people that wanted to remove them, you know, were primarily folks of color. You know, and it was understandable. You know that they would they would feel unwelcome you know in a public place with these sort of uh, symbols you know representing white supremacy you know in such prominent display uh, the people that wanted to, to keep them were primarily white they were primarily older uh, and they just spoke about these sculptures in really uh, specific really personal terms so this one woman stepped up to the mic and she talked about how uh, when she was a kid uh, she would drive by that spot every day and she would sort of uh, it was before the sculpture was there, but she would sort of, you know, look at the park. And then one day, uh, when uh, her mother was driving her to the dentist, uh, suddenly the sculpture was there, and she thought that she had somehow willed it into existence. And this is what she's, you know, she's telling the commission. Uh, and it seems, you know, on one level it seems silly, right? Like it's a childhood fantasy. But on another level, it sort of points to how people get entwined, like their own narratives get entwined in these things that really have nothing to do with them. Uh, but it becomes hard to let go of, right? If you sort of imagine that, you know, from a child you sort of had that connection, you know, to it, and now as a woman in her probably 70s, you know, maybe even 80s, you know, like suddenly like there's, you know, like, like there's a personal connection that has nothing to do with the thing itself. And I don't want to disrespect her personal connection. Like obviously everybody bonds with the world in unique ways, but uh, those forums really laid bare for me, like that the reasons that people want to keep those things like aren't always the stated reasons of history or heritage or you know that kind of thing, but that sometimes it's you know imagined histories or imagined personal narratives, you know, or that kind of thing. That's interesting, especially because as you mentioned before, like the statue wasn't like Lee and Jackson weren't even, you know, yeah. they weren't even in the city, and it's yeah. interesting how personal, how how personal feelings would make that, that yeah. statue come. But Maryland, uh, as a state, was very divided during the Civil War, like, you know, so there was a lot of Confederate sympathy, you know, there. So it doesn't seem like such a stretch to me that folks, you know, would have that sympathy handed down generationally in their family uh, and then feel this very tight affinity to it. So, you know, if one's ancestors fought in the Civil War, I can see why you would be upset if you thought that a monument that was connected to that was being removed, right? Um, so I don't, you know... I. I don't think that that should override, you know, public concern, you know, or the consideration, you know, for kindness, you know, in public spaces and, you know, trying to be inclusive and make people welcome, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think it trumps any of that. Uh, but at the same time, I do, you know, I do feel some uh, some empathy for them as well. I know you mentioned um, the Baltimore uprising, and I know your uh, another piece of your work, the Be More Dot, mm -hmm. um, you know, addresses that. Um, what effect did capturing that moment after Freddie Gray's um, death have on you as an artist and you as a Baltimore resident? Well, uh, I hadn't made pictures of people in about 10 years prior to the uprising, but in the days after the uprising, I felt like it was important to make pictures of people. Uh, I kept seeing this really abstract language that was being used to talk about 
uh, like, you know, you see this language like thugs, you know, that's sort of a racially loaded, you know, blanket term, um, you know, for individuals. And I just wanted to uh, find a way to push back against that narrative, like rather than thinking of Baltimore as a city of thugs and drug dealers and, you know, poverty stricken people, I wanted to, you know, actually find a way to, uh, you know, to represent those individuals and for them to be considered as individuals and as people. Uh, so I guess I was hoping that it would be a way to um, to establish shared humanity and make people, you know, really think that there are um, about the human costs of all of this stuff. Uh, so with that, I shot a lot of pictures. Some of them got picked up by major news organizations. Uh, so like CNN ran them and uh, uh, BuzzFeed News, which is the news division of BuzzFeed, uh, ran them and some other major publications like the Boston Chronicle uh, ran them as well. Uh, which for me, I was very pleased about because I felt like I was getting, uh, like I was representing it differently than I was seeing it, you know, represented. Uh, so that was meaningful to me. Uh, but I guess just like everything else on the internet, like you should never read the comments because, um, you know, when you read the comments in some of those articles, people are talking about people with red eyes as being intoxicated with marijuana or those kinds of things, which I think is, uh, you know, a highly suspect um, assumption, you know, to, uh, to make. Um, so it, it sort of made me, you know, realize that uh, a photograph is, you know, I don't know, a photograph never communicates everything that you know that it communicates, right? Like it's a truth, but it's a partial truth, and uh, people still bring their own biases to it. And I saw a lot of implicit bias, you know, play out in those kinds of situations. Um, so I realized that, um, too, at the time, that I didn't want to just make work about that moment of crisis. Like it was a moment of pain, and specifically it was a moment of black pain in the city. And I didn't want to make work, you know, just about black pain. So what I ended up doing was reaching out to a number of community organizations and seeing if I could uh, partner with them, if I could, you know, find a way to make images that uh, would help them in their missions. So one of the groups uh, that I reached out to is a group called Jubilee Arts, and it's located physically about half a mile from the, the epicenter of the uprising and it serves that neighborhood. And basically they provide uh, art classes and social services to underserved youth in the neighborhood, uh, give them a safe place to go after, uh, after school. And I made a series of, uh, of portraits you know, of, um, you know, of those youth that are involved in their various programs. Uh, and then I also made a lot of pictures for them for different fundraisers or you know, other, uh, you know, other events for them you know, where um, I, I was trying to find a way to give as much as I was taking, you know, because I was aware that I was asking something, you know, of the organization and of people, and I wanted to find a way to give something, you know, too. So uh, I did a family portrait day in the gallery where I set up a backdrop and studio lights and families could come have their portrait made at no cost. Uh, I did um, an event where they did a dance, and I set up a photo booth for that and made portraits at no cost. Uh, I also went to their uh, dance recitals and uh, set up a little portrait booth and made portraits, you know, at no cost. And the organization was able to use all of those, you know, towards their uh, their fundraising efforts. Uh, and parents were able to get pictures of their kids, you know, like good pictures for free, you know, kind of thing. I think that's really that's really interesting um, that you, you would use your your camera both as a way to share the story and also to provide a service mm -hmm. almost. Yeah. Um, so as a photographer, your camera like kind of creates a literal space between you and your subject matter. Mm -hmm. Do you think? you see a difference in your role, like, do you see a difference in your role as an artist versus, like, a social activist? Would you call yourself a social activist? Oh, uh, yeah, it, I mean, that's a really interesting question. It's, uh, it's complicated. Uh, yes, I do think of myself as, a, I would say, social advocate, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rather than activist. But at the same time, I don't shy away from, you know, being an activist. Like, if I see something that I think is messed up, like, I'm trying you know, to bring that conversation forward, you know, so that hopefully things can, can get better. Um, so with that uh, question about distancing, uh, I try really hard to not retreat behind the camera. Uh, like I talk to everybody that I photograph, like I don't just walk up and point a camera at people and start shooting pictures. Like there's a conversation that precedes each of those images and it's really important to me to get consent uh, from everybody that I photograph. Uh, to be clear, I did not ask the police for consent because they're public employees in a, a public situation uh, and the courts have ruled consistently that, you know, in Maryland anyway, that you can photograph the police and that they can't uh, stop you from doing so. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't feel bad uh, with that because um, I see it as a measure of accountability, you know, for a police force that's had trouble and uh, is currently under a consent decree from the Department of Justice 
uh, even though this is presidential administration tried to stop that, it did go forward uh, and reform is happening. Uh, but with the people in the neighborhood, like they don't have the same power and I try to be really aware that like I have a different level of power than they have. Uh, so it becomes about having a conversation with people, talking with people, you know, asking respectfully, getting to know people a little bit, you know, making a picture. And then my camera is linked to my phone uh, by, by Wi-Fi so people can see their pictures uh, right away and we can have a conversation, you know, about that. Uh, the people that I photograph um, will sometimes transmit it to themselves, like they'll, uh, you know, text it or email it to themselves, you know, from my phone so then they get a copy of it too. So. I see that conversation as being really crucial. Like it's not just me pointing a camera and sort of you know acting at a remove and taking it. Instead, it becomes a dialogue or a process. Uh, that's not to say that I don't have power in the situation because you know I absolutely do, and I try to take that. Um, I, I try to take responsibility, you know, for that, uh, you know, for that power dynamic. Uh, but at the same time, you know, by working collaboratively and by you know showing people the representations and by giving the pictures, you know, to everybody uh, if they want them you know, becomes a way to um, be a little bit more fluid and hopefully a little bit more generous in terms of how those representations happen. Do you think that the camera's barrier impacts your role as an activist? Like, do you think that, um, yeah, for better or for worse, you know? I mean, I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is that I hope it doesn't, mm -hmm. but uh, I know that, you know, on some level, you know, it does too, so you know, whenever you point a thing at somebody else and you sort of are behind this, you know, behind this object. Um, yeah, so, um, so I, I guess I, I don't have a firm answer to that. Uh, I hope not, but probably a little bit. It's understandable. Um, so I'm gonna, I have a few more questions to finish up here. Um, so with so many different components of your actual work, what would you say is your overarching purpose? You do a lot of projects, but like what would you say is your purpose? <laughs> um, I mean, that's, uh, that's the, the million dollar question. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, I do a lot of research and I'm very careful you know, about uh, projects. Like I try to tread lightly and tread carefully and be respectful of people. And, uh, and all of those kinds of things, but you know, ultimately I hope that I can contribute to the social record you know, of this moment in time, that I can document uh, what I see as a political and social transformation of the U.S. Like I think that you know, the Obama uh, presidency was transformative in a lot of ways, and I think the Trump presidency you know, is also transformative in many ways. And uh, I've heard American history described as a pendulum that swings back and forth, and you know, eventually comes the rest in the middle. Uh, I hope that that's true. Right now, I feel like the pendulum is way out of whack, you know, in one direction. So if I can uh, use the uh, the camera as an advocacy tool, you know, to uh, to call attention to the things that I find problematic, and if I can use the camera as a, a, a tool of history, you know, to historicize these moments, you know, and to create documents, um, you know, hopefully that you know that is a mission in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, also looking at other transformations like social media, and you know, how the cultural shifts have happened around that and contribute to that conversation. So, you know, ultimately I hope to be in dialogue with the larger American culture and to, you know, maybe give people um, uh, a tool through my art to analyze, you know, their own lives and their own belief systems, you know, in relation to these bigger cultural forces that are beyond us as individuals. That's, uh, I like that, that's really good. Um, and you would say that this, like, vocation or your or purpose is, is mm -hmm. a lot different than what your job is. That is like... I mean, my job is all connected, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, ideally, my job is leading young artists to find their own voices too. You know, that's a best case scenario. Obviously, there's, <laughs> you know, there's there's bumps along the way, and there's committee work and things that are less fun. But uh, you know, ultimately, I have the best job in the world, right? Because I get to work with young artists, and I get to help them find their voice, and you know, they help me find my voice too, as we were saying earlier. So there's a, you know, there's a really good synergy there. And hopefully, you know, all of them will go on to contribute to these cultural conversations too, you know, in meaningful ways. And I think the more voices, the better. What advice would you offer to students who see creative practice as their calling? Um, slash, are there ways that they can be more ready to step into that field? I don't think anybody's ever ready, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you either do it or you don't do it. And if you keep doing it long enough, eventually you'll get better at it. And if you keep doing it even longer, people will notice. And then you keep doing it even longer and you'll get wider recognition. So like, it's all about endurance. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So, you know, that's the best advice I can give young artists is to, um, you know, to think of it as a marathon. Like think about it in terms of the distance, like don't think of it in terms of like, 
um, you know, I want to get this show next year, or I want to get this publication next year, because, you know, okay, cool, what happens when you get it? Do you stop being an artist? Is it over? So I try not to define my my thinking about my trajectory around, like, um, an outcome like that. I try to think of it in terms of the inquiry. Like, if you keep asking questions, like, it never stops, right? So, like, that's how, hopefully, you sustain. Uh, and I've been doing this, um, you know, 15 years or so, which is a chunk of time, but I look at older artists that have been doing this their entire lives, and, you know, they're, they're my role models, like, they're my heroes, and I know not all of them get the recognition that they deserve, but it's not even about that at the end of the day. You know, it's about contributing, and hopefully I'm making a contribution and, you know, moving forward. Uh, the other advice I would give young artists is that find a few, um, a few confidants, a few friends that you can trust, and tune everybody else out, because uh, everybody's got an opinion and not all of them are helpful. So uh, for young artists, if you can find who you trust and you know, show them uh, the things that you're thinking about, and you know, they'll help you move forward. And if you, can form, um, you know, if you can form a team that helps each other move forward, that's even better. Like I don't think anybody, um, I don't think anybody should do this in isolation. Like I think it should be in conversation. And uh, you have to find that core community you know, that you trust and then uh, you know, take their advice. And, and, and run with it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's all the questions I have for you today. Um, thank you again for coming in and having this interview. It's been really interesting to hear your perspective as an artist, especially around all these um, different subject matters that you t uh, touch on. Yeah. Well, so thank you for inviting me. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Good. Thank you. I think we're done. Now. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Uh, um, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, we went a little bit over time, but not by much. But, but like eight. Yeah, minutes. I wasn't even watching, so I have no idea. Yeah. But, uh, good. I was trying to like. Yeah, like a schedule, like I don't want to make you late for... No. I think uh, the next thing is until dinner, so... Oh, nice. Well, I Of course, what time is it? It's 4. 4.08? Yeah. 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 I think we're fine. I don't know. I just get where Amy tells me to go. <laughs>